using, in contrast to many of my colleagues, in using the concept of historical truth. If that, if you call this Rankian, okay, that's fine for me. Then call it Rankian. There is Robert Darnton, for example, uh, called the upsurge of the, the thirst for historical truth in uh, Solidarity Poland, a Rankian urge to know the truth. The Poles wanted to know the truth about, for example, the war crime in Katyn. And uh, in, in the era of Solidarity, people uh, began to ask questions about it, uh, to express questions about Katyn uh, in public. Not only in secrecy, but in public. Darnton, Robert Darnton, who saw this happening, called it a Rankian, a Rankian thirst for truth. I believe that we have to tentatively search for the truth and we, that we should not give up this mission. Now, I, I understand that the word truth has some absolutist ring in it. So, I will quote one of my favorite um, idols. His name is Groucho Marx. He says, <laughs> he says, I have my principles, but if you do not like them, I have others. <laughs> so, if you do not like the concept of historical truth, take another concept, such as re reliable knowledge about the past, which amount to the same. But for me, it is, it is um, useless to avoid that central concept. For the second question, are there patterns in, in world history? That is a difficult question, of course. Is science subjected to laws of development? I don't know, but any theoretical interpretation of the history of science tries to see something more than the anecdotal. And if you, once you transcend the anecdotal, we are talking already more or less about primitive, primitive forms of patterns. Okay, just one short uh, question coming on that. We have a Danish thinker called Hal Kopp, and he says about democracy, and uh, democracy as a form of life that's Inclusion of different opinions, even the undemocratic opinions, is democracy. And I'm just, you know, thinking, you know, that when you write history, what and what is responsible for history? You know, people can argue, okay, my version of history is responsible. I'm looking for the truth. Okay. And another <laughs> historian can say the same thing, can claim the same thing about this you know, a totally different version of history. And I think, you know, democracy is when you're always, like a mirror thesis, when you're always in doubt, when you're always arguing, and you, you're trying to argue for the best, uh, you know, not the best version, but the most plausible version, you know. So, I'm just saying that, I think, you know, the, the response, you know, the word responsible in clients and includes some normative aspects that is uh, a little bit problematic can be at least, because it excludes some persons. Conclusion, but not with the second. Uh, I, be I believe that responsible, the, the, the concept of res responsible historical writing is problematic, and it, it, it has to be discussed. But uh, not because it, exclude, ex it excludes certain forms of historical writing. It should exclude certain forms of irresponsible historical writing and certain abuses of history. Um, of course, you can, if you produce history, you can claim that your history is responsible. But then I said in my lecture, there is always, you have, do not have the last say. The last say is for the peers. There is a peer review, a form of quality control, and it is only the community of historians or the community of history teachers agrees that what you propose is a responsible form of historical writing or history education, that it is. So you can propose, you can claim that your version of history is a responsible version, 
but you do not have the last word. Thank you. That's how science works. Hi, I'm, I'm more than I teach uh, history here in Copenhagen. Thank you for a very uh, good presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. I actually thought that it could have been nice if I knew you in 2001 when I did my thesis on the <coughs> Chilean <laughs> Truth and Reconciliation Commission called the Reddit Commission. Because there are a lot of uh, useful <laughs> information in your presentation that I could have used back then. It made me think about, do you, do you, does one theory exclude the other? Because I was thinking, in Chile, uh, the responsibility of story writing, which was made in the uh, Commission's report in Chile, uh, I would say that that was an amplifier thesis. It does, it did uh, help strengthen the Chilean democracy. At the same time, I would argue that if we live in Spain, I'm sorry to my Spanish colleagues here but, uh, at the conference, but if we live in Spain, the lack of responsible historical writing in their transition, the lack of, of, of truth in Spain <laughs> has, uh, has helped shape Spanish democracy in a, in a bad way, I would say. So my question is, does one theory exclude the other? I would say that, that in Chile we have the amplifier thesis, and in Spain we would have the, what's it called, the uh, midwife the, uh, theory. I am, um, at first sight, this is a, thank you for your question. Um, I never talked about this in this way, but I think that, of course, in a, given that democracy they usually develops in a national framework, that the, uh, 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 um, the judgments about which of the four theses is applicable will differ. In Chile, yes, you had a theoretic commission. Um, immediately after uh, the, the withdrawal of Pinochet, uh, and uh, it, had, it had a huge impact on Chilean society, I, I agree, and the President I agree. <coughs> Despite the fact that the only historian who was part of that uh, Commission de Verdad y Reconciliación, I believe it was called, that the, despite the fact that the only historian who was a member of that Commission, Gonzalo Bial, was a former Minister of Ed Education under Pinochet. But he did not play a crucial role in that commission. And in the, the, in the report, of course, but in, in that commission. The, the central figure to my mind was José Salaquet, the human rights. It had a tremendous impact, and you could say, yes, this is the amplifier thesis. It contributed to democracy. It was a history tool, the report of the theoretic commission, uh, or the Commission de Verdad y Reconciliación, it contributed, it strengthened the democracy. Spain is a different story, I agree. But uh, you only, to my mind, you only tell half of the story. Because there has been a Pacto de Olvido in Spain after Franco's death. Uh, and until uh, around 2000, the year 2000. That first generation of 25 years, there was silence. The, the Spaniards, the Spanish agreed not to talk about the civil war and the, the dictatorship that followed it. That was one generation. But then, very interesting, and I alluded to it in my talk, the next younger generation did not understand that silence. And they started to delve into the past. It was remarkable. Again, it was not the work of historians. Because these historians in, in Spain were, they, they were not forbidden to work about Franco and about the dictatorship. But it were courageous journalists who started opening the anonymous graves in which the Republicans were interred. The Republican victims of the Civil War and early Francos. <coughs> but then everything changed in the year 2000. There was a book by a friend of mine, Enrique Silva, called Las Fosas de Franco, the graves, Franco's graves. And in 2004, after the attempts at Atocha, 
the, uh, suddenly the government changed, and the children of the, the Republican victims of the Civil War came to power. And they facilitated a new legal framework to investigate the past. This is called, I believe, the La Ley de Memoria Historica, the, the law of historical memory, which is, is a legal framework which serves to investigate uh, the Franco. So there the experience is mixed. There was no or little influence in the, for the first generation after Franco's death. But then, around 2000, with the younger generation asking questions, there was a strengthening effect on democracy. I'm Luis uh, from Spain. I'm a history teacher. So uh, I just uh, need, to, uh, need to talk about this, uh, this topic. And I, I would like to agree, I would like to add that uh, I completely agree with Anton. I think that the, the problem in Spain is not uh, simple because there was an rupture between the elite during the Franquism and the next generation. There was a, like a kind of treaty, like a kind of part of the, the consensus, uh, which is called in, in Spain. And I think that uh, we have uh, some problems, obviously, in Spain. We have to um, improve our system in Spain, our democracy. But uh, I think that some uh, Republicans from the Republican system in Spain would be proud about our system today. We just uh, need more time, and the younger generation will do it. Just simple like this. Because uh, we have some problems uh, to recuperate um, some uh, law about uh, our memory. We just, we just uh, need more time about this question because our government now, our government now uh, don't want to develop this law now. But uh, I think that the, in the next coming election, we'll be seeing the, the changes about this. Can I, can I, you can comment, of course. Yes. Brazil. Brazil has, has had a dictatorship between 1964 and 1985. In 1985, a, uh, a small report, Nunca Marge, uh, was published. It was a tremendous success, a bestseller. And then we had nothing until the year 2012. Although, in a relative obscurity, historians in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Natal, uh, Fortaleza, they started investigating that period of repression. And when the Truth Commission was finally established in 2011-2012, under Dilma Rousseff, President Dilma Rousseff, herself a victim of torture under the dictatorship, the historians presented their work to the Truth Commission. And they said, look, this is what we have done in the years <coughs> after the downfall of the dictatorship. Please profit from our knowledge and from our report. And the Truth Commission in Brazil did this, although to a very limited extent. At least the Central Truth Commission, because it was a Truth Commission at the central, the federal level, but there were also dozens of smaller truth commissions for each state. And there, the fruits of historical scholarship were used in them. <coughs> and that's where the story is going to be Thank you. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions, and then we're going to, to finish. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah. two questions. Yes. He was first. He was first. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if history should punish the past, what do you think about giving amnesty? And what do you think about the uh, historian's role in, in when, when, for instance, in, in South Africa, you have the Commission of Truth, and they gave amnesty as long as they told the truth. Uh, do you think it's the right approach, or do you, what do you think when we, we get uh, so responsible as we begin to sentence people and we begin to have like a, a role where we actually can go and, and sentence people to death? Do you understand my question? The, the last part? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, in, in, uh, it's because of me, myself, I want to comment. I really like the idea 
that telling the truth is enough. That if you tell the truth, the truth is so important that you give people empathy. And I'm a history professor at Tel Aviv University. I have a very simple question. Whether your theory is applicable to places where the conflict did not end yet, or democracy did not start yet. Most of your examples touch area where the process of democracy has started for some reason or other, by politicians, by historical circumstances, Spain after Franco, Brazil after the generals, South Africa after apartheid. So you did basically how is the responsible historical writing applicable in a post-conflict or a transitional situation. I wonder if this theory is applicable also in places my, of my own country, but the conflict did not end yet, and there is no sign for end. It is in, within, we are in an in-conflict situation, and I wonder if politically this theory can be applic applicable where both sides are still uh, emerged in the intractable conflict uh, ideology and the use of these attempts is something which is totally irrelevant because it weakens the conflict since both sides are still think the conflict is something that can nature collective identity with the other. So my simple question is is your theory applicable in an in-conflict situation and not, oh, it is applicable only in post-conflict situation. My answer is very simple. Yes, it is applicable in any conflict situation. Um, I, as I told you from the beginning, I made an analysis of ideal times. So, uh, of course, this is, when you apply it to concrete cases, it's always a bit difficult, but um, first, you should try to define the situation. And if I look at Israel and the occupied territories and the Palestinian Authority, I would say this is, a, of course, a, 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 a society in conflict since 48, if not earlier. If not earlier. Um, um, but I cannot call Israel a dictatorship. Uh, there is freedom of expression, and uh, historians can do their work, uh, not perhaps as well as, uh, as uh, in, for example, in Europe, in most European countries, but they, they, uh, they can do their work and they can publish. So several of the conditions necessary for to, come to, to uh, exercise responsible historical writing are present in, in, in that society. Especially for Israeli historians, the situation for uh